Welcome to Mandhua Fury. Mandhua starts by showing a beautiful castle our main character is going somewhere, as interpreted by two guards guarding the entrance to the Demon Lord's castle, to see a beautiful girl and warn her that only those who have permission to do so can enter. This did not stop Milady, and she sharply told them that although she did not have this permission, she could provide them with a subpoena. The young people were taken aback by such pressure and asked to forgive them for the misunderstanding. The cute girl was Sirin Follix, who came into this world just a year ago. In her first incarnation, she was a simple high school student who loved to read romantic novels and lived to be only 19 years old. Since she went to an all-girls school, she never dated boys or even held hands. In her second incarnation, she was a virgin spirit in the underworld, where she told raunchy stories to sullen priests. One of the priests once told her that she had amazing high-level energy and that he was seeing this for the first time in his existence. One day, Sirin was praised by the Lord of Spirits himself and granted her life in the form of a succubus, thanks to which her hair acquired a coral silver hue and her eyes became bright purple. Being a virgin spirit, the main character wrote a novel in two volumes, 5,500 Shadows of the Demon Lord, which tells about the illicit affair of a girl living with the Demon Lord. In fact, because of this novel, Sirin received a lawsuit. All the girl was thinking about then was how she would get out of this situation. As soon as he received the letter, the guard immediately saw the handwriting in which it was written and quickly began to act. He ordered to warn his majesty that the author of that novel for perverts had arrived. This statement embarrassed Siren quite a lot. She wanted to fall to the ground from shame, but embarrassment quickly ceased to worry her because upon entering the castle, she realized how much her ideas about the castle differed from reality. It seemed to her that the world of demons was not very different from the modern world of the 21st century. The castle looked like a film set for a film where several styles of architecture came together at once. The castle was a place where the world of demons was not very different from the modern world. Her thoughts did not stop only at the beauty of the castle but also at the rumors floating around about the beauty of the demon lord. Passing by the mirror, she involuntarily looked into it, trying to imagine how to behave when they were introduced to each other, because the demon lord, having appeared seven years ago, turned the tide of the then ongoing war, and, in Siren's opinion, should have not only a brilliant mind but an amazing oh body. God. Wow. The flow of her thoughts was interrupted by the greeting of His Majesty Claude Stern entering the room. In response to this greeting, the large hall doors opened, and a dark silhouette of a man appeared behind them. Realizing that this was the demon lord himself, Siren bowed her head in front of him, obeying the customs of this world. Not daring to raise her head, she heard a firm and calm statement that they had already met with him once. The guards who had been leading her all this time simultaneously raised their spears, blocking her path and causing a loud clang of metal on metal to be heard throughout the hall. Still looking down at the Lord's boots, Sirin heard an order to raise her head. She was very afraid to see the ruler's face, so she decided to raise her head after only a few painful seconds. A handsome, dark-haired young man appeared before her. She could not believe that he was the demon lord. His piercing gaze said much more than himself because all he said was about what she called him once in their first meeting. Sirin absolutely did not understand what incident Claude was talking about, and realizing this, the demon lord decided to remind her about it. Unlucky bastard, that's what she called the demon lord the first time they met. A week earlier, Sirin was lying peacefully on a bench in the park sipping a wonderful tasting wine. She heard the sounds of footsteps approaching the place where she was, and decided to open her eyes and look at the intruder. A young man appeared before her eyes, whose well-fitting uniform involuntarily drove her crazy. The stranger stared at her so intently, which quite confused the girl. Getting up and finally sitting on the bench, she thought about how tiring it was to be a beauty because the demon lord was not a beauty. The uninvited guest was not the first to stare at her, and the flow of her drunken thoughts led to the quite logical conclusion, in Siren's opinion, that the stranger had fallen in love with her, which she told him about. In response to this phrase, the thoughts of the ruler looking straight at her, rushed from assessing this lady's condition to what she was even talking about. All that the ruler saw in front of him was a jelly-like body located right on a bench in a crowded place, and all he wanted was to order the guards to remove him to the appropriate place. He was a man of his word, and he was a man of his word, but realizing that he still needed to answer something, he said that he had no idea what she was talking about, and that she could continue to sleep peacefully. Then his gaze fell on the very place where she was lying because after sitting down on the bench, it turned out that the girl was lying on her own book. Having seen the book, I decided to ask what kind of strange book it was, on which one could easily fall asleep. Realizing that the stranger was looking at her novel, 
Sirin decided to check where it was after all, and without taking her eyes off the guest, she fumbled with her hand for the book near her. The girl began to talk about how it was a novel written in two volumes, clearly proud that a stranger was interested in her work. He approached her with a sharp step, quickly grabbed the subject of discussion, and began twirling it with interest. After he ensured that this was exactly the novel he was thinking about, the bishop asked caustically whether it described stupid relationships. At this remark, Sirin quickly stood up from the bench and, with growing anger, decided to ask again whether she had heard what was said correctly. The Lord said that this was a rather funny book and there was no need to react like that about it. But Sirin's anger knew no bounds. Her heart was beating wildly because they had touched her most intimately. And having already completely sobered up, she decided to put the offender in his place, saying that she was the author of this book. She added that the uninvited guest did not dare to speak like that since, most likely he had never even held a woman's hand, which would have hurt his opponent. But this did not stop the ruler, and he decided to invite her to do something more useful than writing boring novels, which angered the girl even more. After all his statements, he declared that he had no time to waste time on stupid arguments and hurried away. And at that very moment, when the stranger began to move away, Sirin called the demon lord himself an unlucky bastard and still couldn't understand what was wrong with this guy that he could so easily humiliate a girl he didn't know. This last statement had the greatest effect as it sank into his very heart. Leaving with a calm look, he only told her that since she did not know who he was, then the wise ruler would tell her and would not leave her unpunished. Remembering that incident, Sirin, standing under the security guards, understood that she was completely in trouble. No, God, please, no, no! and would no longer be able to go unpunished. The Lord standing in front of her knew about her past incarnation as a virgin spirit and pointed out to her how arrogant it was for her to make fun of him based on his past experience with Sakubi. His majesty turned to an older man standing at a distance and said that it would be a good idea to ban all books that spread deliberately false information about his person. All Sirin could think about at that moment was that there was no false information about his highness in her novel. The older man turned out to be the head of the royal library. He opened her novel and began to explain to her that the events described in the book were very controversial. Seeing that she really screwed up big time, all she can wait for is a death sentence, because the accuser is himself a demon lord. Secretly, she hoped that her book would be removed from sale and all profits received from sales would be taken away. In the hope of mitigating the death sentence, she said that it was an innocent joke. Claude Stern closed his eyes, exhaled resignedly, calmed his thoughts, and calmly said that he did not think so. After this, he opened his eyes and looked piercingly at Sirin, who was pretending to be entirely innocent. She was very frightened by this look. It was so heavy that she felt uneasy, but she continued to control herself. The demon lord did something completely unexpected for everyone in the hall. He touched the clip on his tie, causing the gem in the clip to sparkle with a bright purple glow, and the lord said that there would be no trial. He added to his oath that the book would be banned as long as it contained false information about him. An oath on a gemstone, which like the heart of the demon itself, is the source of all his powers, means that this oath cannot be broken. Violation of this obligation will lead to the death of the one taking the oath. The chief librarian, who was the head of the library, said that the book would be banned and that he would not be able to read it. The chief librarian became seriously nervous from such statements because all the demons who read this book would also be punished, which is what he decided to warn the ruler about. The book was a bestseller in the demon world and was read by more than half the population. His majesty only had one of the many copies. The guards were taken aback by the popularity of the novel and looked puzzled at Sirin, who was still standing behind them. She was calmed by the thought that half of the demons in this world would serve their punishment for reading oh the book. Wow. Just like her. The head librarian decided that he could help in the current situation and suggested a different way to solve the problem than punishing half of the demon world. The guards slowly walked away behind Sirin, so she did not even notice it because the conversation with the older man carried her away. The librarian said that they must make sure that everything that was written in this book became true. There was enough time for this because decisions in the demon world took place after 444 days. This greatly strained the demon lord. However, the royal librarian continued that according to the laws of the demon world, if at least half of what is written in a book is true, then it does not fall under the dissemination of false information. Sirin still did not understand what the librarian was leading to and looked at the demon lord with a question. Then, the older man brought his story to an end, concluding that within the specified period, his majesty would have to prove that at least half of what was written was true. The girl, still not understanding that this was about her too, 
decided to turn her back on Siren, was secretly glad that the ruler would have to answer for his words, but her joyful expression did not escape the librarian's gaze. He realized that she still did not understand what was in store for her. The older man approached her and very calmly informed her that she would also have to work hard to make half of the book true, because the story was told in the first person. Then the girl understood everything, realized everything, and began to remember the frank scenes she described in her book. The book, 5,500 Shadows of the Demon Lord, was an erotic novel, and since the Lord himself was himself in the book, she was to become the main character. Her thoughts could not be stopped. She could not believe that she would have to play this role because otherwise all her beloved readers would go to prison. All her anger and all her indignation were directed at one object, the demon lord, who so thoughtlessly swore on the stone. At the same time, Claude asked the librarian what would happen if he just killed the author of the novel now to which the elder assured him that then the bishop himself would die. The girl only dreamed that the citizens of this world would know how cruel their king really is, that he is capable of killing an innocent person so cold-bloodedly. Her thoughts were calmed by the fact that the trial could only begin from the day of her death, and before that, there were 440 days left. The demon lord took his copy of the novel and, using magic, wanted to return it to its original place among the other books. At the same time, the guards in the hall announced the arrival of the demon queen. Siren involuntarily turned around to look at the entering figure. From the first seconds, she was fascinated by the beauty and grace of the queen, whose name was Valeria Itera. King Claude turned to Valeria and calmly asked why she was there. To this question, the beautiful queen covered her face with a fan and, with the most graceful air, said how embarrassed she was by the question asked. The bishop lowered his eyes in embarrassment, apparently not even thinking that his question was so inappropriate for a lady. He quickly pulled himself together and ordered everyone to leave, everyone except the head royal librarian. The queen ordered the maid to leave the box, after which the maid, Rosalie, hastily left the room. When all the strangers left, Claude decided to clarify what had confused Valeria. The king's displeased appearance only made the queen laugh, and she playfully told him to try to understand her and, if he so desired, he could be a queen himself. Sirin, whom everyone had forgotten a little about, was taken aback by such a conversation and involuntarily began to listen to him more and more. It was a discovery for her that the king and queen play the roles of spouses only in public. It was as if the veil of this secret family had been lifted for her because, in the eyes of everyone, the demon king who abolished slavery was prudent and kind-hearted. Still, without an audience, he treated those around him rather rudely. The queen was kind and sweet in public, then alone with her husband, without prying eyes, where she seemed like a cruel and serious lady, and then a quick cold look from the queen interrupted all Siren's thoughts. Valeria ran up to the girl at lightning speed, grabbed her by both hands and very loudly asked to forgive the author of the novel for her rudeness. Such an outburst took Siren aback. But out of the corner of her eye, she noticed that the king grinned at the queen's actions and wondered if they were really spouses, more like brother and sister. Holding the hands of the author of the novel, Valeria turned to the librarian with a request to explain what happened there. Paul Segan, who is also a librarian, began to tell the queen what had happened. Puzzled, she listened attentively without interrupting or asking unnecessary questions and she did not doubt the veracity of what was said. Continuing to listen to the story of what happened, the queen clenched her teeth more and more. Anger was clearly growing rapidly within her, which Siren, who had been watching her all this time, clearly noticed. Having listened to the whole story to the end, Valeria attacked Claude with all her rage because how dare he bother her favorite author. Is it really because the queen reads her books every day before going to bed? The girl was pleasantly surprised by such circumstances. She never expected that the queen of demons herself was an ardent fan of her novel. But Claude was not persuaded, and he calmly said that he had expressed himself clearly and that the queen needed to comply with his demands. Hearing this, Siren's fantasy began to sparkle with wild colors. She began to think that the king and queen had some secret games, violation of the rules of which would result in sexual punishment. While the author of the erotic novel was carried away by her love fantasy, Valeria and Claude argued that the queen should study before going to bed about state affairs rather than read novels. Siren even began to salivate when the arguers finally noticed her. The queen was very concerned about the author's condition. She was so interested in the unfinished ending of the novel that she was ready to argue with the king for as long as she wanted if only Siren could finish it. Valeria took her beloved author by the hands with all admiration, at the same time praising her works and admiring that fate allowed them to meet in such circumstances. The queen also did not ignore her unceremonious husband and gave him the cruelest look of her life. She remembered that a copy of the book was in her bedroom, 
which means Claude went into her bedchamber and took the novel without permission and also looked through it in secret. Siren was embarrassed that she was witnessing a conversation, from which it turns out that the king and queen even sleep in different beds. But Valeria, looking at her, thought about how she could profitably use this new acquaintance in her life. Queen Valeria Itara, before the war, was the princess of Itara a powerful noble family of the Empire of Light. She was also a big fan of Siren Follix's work, so much so that she followed her on social networks. And then a glimmer of hope appeared in her eyes that the king would fall in love with the author of the novel. Valeria herself would be overthrown, and she would be able to return to her kingdom. Miss Follix looked at the sly expression on the queen's face when she suddenly grabbed her hand. The lady rushed with her to the box left by the maid by order of the queen and began to take books out of it, asking her to sign them especially for her. The queen was sorting through a box full of books of the same novel, but she was looking for a specific one. Seeing Claude's favorite rare copy in his hands, she quickly snatched it and decided that the autograph should be in this book. This book was printed in only two copies for the most devoted readers. The first was with the author himself, and the second was with Queen Valeria. Siren immediately understood how her limited edition book ended up with the Demon Lord. She again unwittingly became a listener to a personal conversation between the king and queen, where the ruler displeasantly asked why Valeria told him that, in principle, there were only two books, to which she replied that she meant only a limited edition. The girl had an insight that this whole lawsuit, and in general the whole situation, happened because the king wanted to punish the queen in this way for work not completed on time. It was clear from the demon lord that he was pretty bored with this fuss with books, and he wearily grabbed his head. Siren continued to build a chain of insight that she had simply become a victim in a dispute between the spouses. But even despite this, she could not help but sign the book for her most devoted fan. Queen Valeria was so happy with the autograph that she completely forgot about her recent anger at her husband. After the happiness she had experienced, Milady asked Miss Follux, in a calm voice, that if she did not mind, the queen would like to take the chair and table at which the author was sitting to make it a family heirloom in Etar. She immediately sprang into action, ordering the maids to wrap the items in tape. While everyone was busy with their own affairs, the demon lord involuntarily remembered the scene from the book where the main character's hands were tied with ribbons and asked Saren what it meant. Confused by the question, the girl did not understand why the king asked such a question. Did he really not know what it meant? Lady Valeria decided to explain to Saren that Claude sincerely did not understand what he was talking about, and with all his naivety, he decided to ask her directly about it. In the demonic world, there are only two ways for demons to appear the natural path or incarnation or the rebirth of the soul. In the demonic world, there is no concept of age, and demons are immediately born as adults. So the demon lord appeared in the southern region of the Night Empire seven years ago at the age of approximately 25 years. The queen continued her story about the king, saying that he did not know about love and relationships since, immediately after the war, he immersed himself in work. The overlord was more interested in becoming the supreme emperor than in finding love, so the queen quickly ended her attempts to capture his heart. Trying to smooth over the situation with the heartless king, Valeria noted his handsome face, capable of hiding all his flaws in his soul. Siren took a closer look at the demon lord and indeed noticed that he had quite captivating facial features, and his slightly frowning gaze gave him a rough yet sensual appearance. The girl was perplexed why the queen, his legal wife, was telling her all the details, but then the queen brought her speech to an end and declared that it was the author who could teach love to the king, who understood nothing about love affairs. The main character understood that she also had no experience in love relationships. Love, the concept of the relationship between a man and a woman, was in no way connected in her head with the king and her. The demon lord, outraged by the queen's decision, pointed his finger at Saren and stated that because of her, he could not concentrate on work for a whole week, and it would be better if he did not see her face anymore. Valeria could no longer be stopped, and she began to put pressure on the mistake made earlier because the king did not want half of his subjects to become criminals. Saren no longer saw any other choice but to agree with the queen in everything. She kept thinking that the whole novel was built on passionate desires and that forcing the king to do so could lead to tears, but in her dreams, even with tears, he looked delightful. The girl tried to push away lustful thoughts about the demon lord quickly. The queen, still ardent, decided to clarify with Paul that the final verdict would be based on the integrity of the entire book, to which the librarian gave an affirmative answer. Valeria meticulously gave arguments for a long time in order to completely convince everyone present of the need to make the book truthful 
even though everyone had already understood this long ago. The girl thought that she obviously would not be able to bring all the scenes from the book to life and hoped that by writing a more restrained epilogue, she would be able to bear everything more calmly, but the queen convinced her that this would completely change the mood of the book. Then Saren decided to write several more volumes of her novel so that from the four volumes, she could choose more harmless scenes to embody. This could not but please the queen, and she could not hide her joy from others. Watching the king read her novel, Saren hoped that her editor would understand and would be willing to continue the novel instead of writing an epilogue. Stopping in the middle of the page, the bishop suddenly asked who Simeon was, and he received the answer that Simeon was the main character of the book. The next name interested him no less. Irene turns out to be the main character of the novel, which is Saren's name in her first incarnation. His majesty pointed out that the author specifically wrote her human name so that no one would understand that this was her work. However, Miss Follix replied that in the novel, the main characters communicate informally despite the different statuses of their position. This taunt was smoothed over by the queen, who said that his majesty was gracious enough to forgive the author for this rudeness. The demon lord continued to glare at the slightly impudent Saren. After some time, the girl received a contract to translate into reality the contents of the Book of 5,500 Shadows of the Demon Lord. It also stated that she was now the chief royal author. The queen was undisguisedly delighted with this idea because by doing so, she facilitated Saren's move to the castle, and accordingly, Everything that would happen between her and the king would remain a secret. The king, in turn, again swore on his gem that he would try his best to fulfill the terms of the contract. Unexpectedly for him, the girl extended her hand to him for a handshake to seal their contract and smiled sweetly at him. He jumped out of his seat and quickly moved away to find a suitable room for her, but deep down in his soul, everything began to tremble from Siren's smile. The author stood there, holding out her hand for a handshake, wondering what happened. Left alone, Claude snapped his fingers, and in the blink of an eye, that very novel appeared in front of him. He sat down more comfortably and decided to read the book and understand what it was about him that captivated his queen so much. The king looked wearily at the pages. The strange events of that day made themselves felt. After reading the novel, he drew up a schedule for completing all scenes of thirty lines in just a month. Calling the guard, the lord gave him the list and ordered him to take it to the royal author. At the same time thinking about how easy it would be to do it in a month, if he did a line a day, although he was not delighted with the kisses and hugs in the book. Finally, he was able to sit down and relax after a hard day, but the book did not leave his thoughts. Having once said that, this was a boring book, but now he considered it quite intriguing and, with an interesting emotional component, the king could not believe that a virgin spirit could write such a novel. He was especially interested in one sentence where the heroine was asked if she liked the demon lord. Realizing that he was not in a position to reread such a novel, he drove away all thoughts about the characters in the book. In the mansion, after a hard day, Sirin was relaxing, lounging on a large soft bed, and cursing the lord for giving her a mansion that was not cleaned and covered in dust. Suddenly her anger was interrupted by a loud knock on the door, but she did not hear a voice asking her to enter. Rising up on the bed, the author saw that someone had thrown a letter to her under the door. Strong curiosity prompted her to quickly unpack the letter, which contained a schedule for the execution of scenes from the novel. Sirin regretted seeing this letter a million times because the king decided to complete the plan in a month and even scheduled some scenes for today. She couldn't believe her eyes. No! God, please, no! 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 And she didn't want to believe it. Knowing her book inside and out, she understood that today, she would need to spend this night with the demon lord. The girl immediately rushed to the king for clarification, not understanding why he chose these particular scenes. She wanted to find Claude as quickly as possible and cancel this impossible 30-day plan. Heading to the king's chambers, she involuntarily thought about why he chose precisely the most tactile scenes from the entire plot, where it took two or three lines to describe the positions of the hands alone, and where the explicit scenes were much longer than the non-explicit ones. Having burst into his chambers without an invitation, Siren began to be indignant, but she froze in surprise, due to deep shock. The object of anger accidentally fell out of her hands, but she did not even notice it. An almost completely naked ruler appeared before her eyes, standing with his back to her, from which she could not take her eyes off. Hearing strange sounds coming from behind him, Claude turned around and looked softly at the girl. All Siren's thoughts returned to the queen's words about the lord's beautiful facial features in order to somehow stop looking at his body. But it didn't work out well for her because his back was no longer in his hands, and he could no longer turn to her. She was able to see all the attractiveness of his body, 
which the queen had kept silent about. The king continued to look at her questioningly, waiting for at least some explanation. But without waiting for even the slightest sound, he asked if she shouldn't close her eyes in such cases, and not just stand and devour him with her gaze. Siren finally realized how stupid she looked, and that she really shouldn't have looked at him like that without embarrassment, but she could only say a simple goodbye. She still continued to look at the king, thinking that usually during bathing, there are quite a lot of servants next to the king to help him so why does he do everything himself? The Lord interrupted their awkward silence, saying that she probably couldn't wait to wait for the night. The author was able to tear her gaze away from the Lord's body only after she realized what he had just said, and the colors of embarrassment appeared on her face. Continuing his pressure, Claude said that he had not imagined that she would be the first to come to him, and in order to completely embarrass her, he added that apparently, she was very unbearable. His words had an effect because her face was completely red, and she began to try to convince him that she had not come there for this at all. The Lord continued casually that, in this case, her problem must be solved as soon as possible. The unsuspecting girl only managed to look into his eyes with bewilderment on her face. Bright sparks flew around her, and a second later she and the Lord moved into the bedroom. Magic gently laid the numb siren on a spacious and soft bed. The girl did not dare to open her eyes. After she felt that she was lying on something soft, she finally opened her eyes and saw the Lord above her, who told her to close her eyes again. He would do everything. Yeah, boy. Do it! Just think quickly. The girl was not ready for such a rapid development of events and asked Claude to stop. To this objection, he only affectionately began to take off her shoes, and then Sirin realized that she had no choice. The king decided to remind her that they both agreed to fulfill the contract and suggested only turning off the lights. She, of course, meant the choice of scenes to implement, and not the choice of speed of execution of the contract. The lord, looking at her, smirked smugly and hinted that she probably had to have a reason for coming to him at such a late hour. Hanging over her, he assumed that he knew why she burst into him like that, because he had already read her book. Siren couldn't take her eyes off of her, and she had no choice but to turn off the lights. Siren's eyes were on her, take her eyes off his beautiful body. She didn't even hear him. Her thoughts hovered between the muscles of his sculpted abs. Snapping his fingers, Claude turned off the light, which created a captivating twilight around him. He addressed her by the name of the main character of the book and tenderly extended his hand to her face. Ciaran flinched at the touch to her cheek but did not pull his hand away. In the light of the moon she saw his face smoothly approaching her, and she saw his eyes looking tenderly at her. The girl's thoughts ran through the queen's words that the king did not understand love affairs, but in reality the situation was completely different. Realizing that he was trying to kiss her, she pushed him away and asked if he had really learned everything in the book. Confused, Claude calmly and peacefully answered her in the affirmative so he knew what and how to do. The girl was delighted with such great progress in such a short time. She was inspired by her book which contributed to this. The silence dragged on and to diffuse the situation, Ciaran clapped her hands and asked if the Lord had eaten anything that day. He approached her again, looking straight into her eyes, and continued to remain silent clearly hinting that she was not thinking about that right now. But Ciaran continued to say that she would prefer something sweet. She once heard that it was very important for demons to eat something sweet before going to bed. Addressing her as Irene again, he was still trying to recreate at least one scene from the book. Claude was getting closer and closer. Her heart began to pound wildly with excitement, as if it was about to jump out of her chest. Leaning close to her ear, he gently and affectionately asked her if she was really so afraid of him. Blushing more and more every minute, Ciaran decided to fight back and said that in this form, no one would be afraid of him. But the Lord continued to gently say that he was ready to eat her like candy. Looking into his eyes, she didn't understand where the bold and rude king she had seen during the day had gone. Claude interrupted her thoughts, saying that he wanted to hug her right now. The statement stunned her, and the girl began to try to get out of the situation muttering that she was not ready yet and would not do this with someone who did not have a place in his heart for her. The bishop continued by asking her if she had a place in her heart for him. Out of extreme excitement, Ciaran, without thinking, blurted out that not yet. But his voice and stunning body told her to open her heart, and realizing what she had just said, she sharply covered her mouth with her hand. This answer satisfied Claude's curiosity. He smiled again with all tenderness. Moving away from her, he continued to enjoy the moment. Claude continued to ask if she had finished her chatter. Realizing that her words had no effect, 
she began to agree with him. The Lord took her by surprise, saying that it turned out that they had played out one of the planned scenes. They repeated a few lines of dialogue as his gem began to glow. The Lord initially enchanted his stone so that each completed scene would be marked with a bright glow. The king continued to say that they had completed the task, but Ciaran had mixed feelings. She completely forgot that all those phrases that Claude said were written by her in the novel. Crying with relief, she vaguely realized that there was no need to answer the ruler's questions so stupidly. Her relaxation was interrupted by the king's phrase, where he jokingly clarified that she didn't hope that he would really hug her. Ciaran clearly did not expect this, which she informed the king about, but he only noticed that all this time, she had not taken her eyes off his body, and the girl asked him to get dressed quickly. Moving away from her, Claude quoted a line from the book she had written, which said that making love is the best cure for depression. All the social media posts in which she had actually said such things flashed through her mind. Having regained control, she began to ask the ruler to get dressed as soon as possible so that no one would misunderstand them, and in general she did not consider his body attractive. But his soul said the opposite. What was said was received by the king with misunderstanding. He decided to clarify that she was talking about actions that could be misunderstood. Still, at the same time he wondered whether she realized that this was necessary for the implementation of the plan. Startled, she looked away from the speaker and realized the stupidity of her thoughts. Then, the ruler decided to understand how she was going to carry out her plans if she was not ready to do anything with someone for whom she had no feelings, which completely angered the girl. She replied that she didn't really want to but was simply not eager. Then the king began to parade her, angering her even more. The girl thought again about how cruel he was and that he really deserved to be a demon lord because he irritated her so much. Suddenly she remembered that very list and why she ran to the ruler's chambers, pointed at him with her hand, and asked why he chose such explicit scenes, especially the last ones which made her blush just from reading them. Siren still didn't understand how it was possible that the king, after reading one book, was able to understand romance so quickly and also made a plan that only he himself was delighted with. A paper appeared in front of his face, behind which an indignant Miss Follix was hiding, shouting that they could not be because she had no feelings for him. The Lord closed his eyes, sighed doomedly, and said that no one's feelings now worry him as much as time. After a few moments he scratched the back of his head and suggested that they should spend their nights together. No longer surprised by anything, Sirin decided to clarify that they should spend all nights during the month together. Claude asked what she didn't like, whether the act would last all night, or that it would happen to him, to which the girl answered in the affirmative to both options. Seeing that she wanted to ask him something, the king firmly said that he had already given her the title of royal author, and she did not dare ask him for anything. The writer nevertheless decided to try her luck, and asked to wait until she wrote the remaining parts while the king would adjust the schedule. The tired lord agreed to her terms and gave her three months to write the books, and later he would send her a revised schedule. Having achieved her goal, Sirin happily clenched her fist and exclaimed that she would try her best. The next day, the girl slept and then put things in order in her dream. Sirin was so excited that she did didn't want to wait for the next day. In her new home, she tried to draw water from the only well that stood nearby, but the pump did not give in to her. The enraged Miss Follix hit the iron pump with all her might, burning with anger. Completely exhausted, the writer did not understand why she had to stay in the palace and how long it would take. Memories of the previous day did not leave her thoughts. The unwillingness to believe in everything that was happening was devouring her from the inside. She decided that even if she turned the book into reality, Queen Valeria would not let her leave the palace so easily. When the girl reached the point where the water began to drip from the well, she was struck by the realization that she would have to remain forever a royal author. Since this was the case, um, she decided to try to enter the Royal Academy in order to get some benefit from what happened. The Royal Academy is the only educational institution on the borders of the empires of light and night. In order to get there, you need to pass the entrance exams to the highest score, but you can also pass if someone writes a letter of recommendation someone like the demon lord himself. An unfamiliar knight in black armor burst into her solitude and bowed respectfully. His name was Koran. He was the shadow commander of his majesty's army and the right hand of King Claude. The girl examined her new acquaintance questioningly, trying to guess what face was hidden behind his helmet. Koran lightly pressed the lever of the well and clean, clear water flowed out of it. After which he took out a small red box tied with a ribbon, handed it to the girl and said that it was a gift from the king. No longer? After knowing what to expect from the lord, Siren slowly pulled the ribbon, unpacking the gift. The box contained a schedule for the day and a beautiful black dress with a cutout, 
the same as she described in her novel. The schedule included one of the scenes called a secret meeting after the royal banquet at 16 o'clock. The girl could not help but be pleased that the king changed some scenes, but knowing himself, they were also quite hot. While she was looking at the gifts, the shadow rabbit disappeared without a trace in a puff of black smoke. Returning to the mansion, the writer began to examine the donated dress and was surprised at how attentive the bishop was to little things. She thought that if not for his bad character, she would have attacked him long ago. The girl's peace was disturbed by King Claude, who appeared out of nowhere. With loud indignation, he urged her to get ready quickly because there was no time left. The girl was very frightened. I didn't understand where the ruler had come from, so I screamed loudly. After recovering from her shock, Siren looked at the king and pointed to him. He said he pointed out to him that he had entered without knocking. It was already 15 hours and 40 minutes on the clock, which meant there were only 20 minutes left before the start of the scene, and Claude tried to hurry the girl to get ready. Realizing that Miss Follix was in no hurry to get ready, he snapped his fingers, and the dress itself appeared on her. She looked chic in a black dress and red heels, which could not help but attract the attention of the ruler. Siren admired not only herself but also the power of Claude's magic, which was capable of fulfilling her dreams. The dress fit her perfectly, the open back added sensuality to her look, and the deep cutout in the front added frankness. The king's gaze of admiration did not escape her, and she hinted to him that he was looking at her too closely. The girl remembered that in this scene she had to say that she loved him while he drank white wine, and then he tore her dress, and that was the end of the scene. Taking the book in her hands to clarify the details, she read that the main male character of the novel should unbutton his shirt and take off his shirt. She read that the main male character of the novel should unbutton his shirt and take off his tie. The king calmly asked if she wanted him to remain completely naked. Without thinking for a long time, he took off his dress jacket and abruptly threw it onto a nearby chair. Claude quickly grabbed his tie and also zealously pulled it down throwing it after his jacket. Siren was captivated by such a spectacle because the demon lord himself took off his clothes at her first word. Gradually, the king began to unbutton his snow-white shirt, one button after another, feeling a piercing gaze on him. He raised his eyes to look at his companion. She tried to hide her enormous interest by hiding her face behind her hands, but curiosity took over. Siren still spied on Claude's undressing. Noticing this, the king tried to find out why she was attempting to hide her interest if she was still giving herself away. But all her thoughts were about how hot the demon lord was. Having completely unbuttoned his shirt, he began to roll up the sleeves that were in his way, revealing his strong, muscular arms. The colors rose to her cheeks again just like last night. In her heart, she cursed herself for not describing the naked main character, and therefore Claude only unbuttoned and did not completely remove his shirt. The demon lord finished undressing, plopped down on the bed, and commanded her to do so in an authoritative tone. Her heart beat nervously. Despite her excitement, Siren answered the king in the affirmative. She realized that she could not bear his gaze and tried not to look into his eyes in order to calm her heart. The king reminded her that only time was of paramount importance now hinting that she should hurry up. Siren continued to collect her thoughts, trying to prepare herself for the cherished words, but the lump in her throat did not allow her to say a sound. Having mastered her emotions, she told the king with all sincerity that she loved him. The king lay as satisfied as possible with the scene she had played, so much so that a grin appeared on his face again. Vladeka decided to defuse the tense situation and answered that he did not love her. The answer was not at all a lie. The king was not at all satisfied with the result according to the script. Indignant, Sirin began to scold the king for rushing her, but he was not even in a hurry to play out his text. Seeing the mocking expression on his face, the girl again began to get irritated by this whole idea. His companion again began to say that she loved him, restoring the lost moment, but more timidly. The king was amused by this timidity and said that he did not believe in her acting. This angered Sirin even more and she asked him to follow the script. The girl was angry at how his own role she overcame herself and her emotions and said the cherished words and the ruler still mocked her. The king's amusement continued for quite a long time, thereby irritating Miss Follix more. Finally, she uttered the cherished words so that the king believed in their sincerity, and he answered her in kind. Two glasses of white wine appeared out of thin air in the lord's hands, one of which he handed to Ciaran. Taking one of the glasses, the girl drank a little of the excellent wine poured into it. For example, the demon lord also tried the captivating drink. He removed the glass from his hands, and at the same moment, Ciaran felt the ruler's hot hand on her body. She sipped the wine slowly, realizing how quickly the alcohol had intoxicated her mind. Claude didn't waste any time, and with a powerful gust of his hands tore the bottom of Ciaran's dress. As soon as he did this, 
The stone shone with a purple light, announcing that the scene had actually been played out. The intoxicated girl only heard that such a pose was not in the scene and asked, not understandingly, what pose we were talking about. She didn't notice how she gradually climbed over the young ruler and practically clung to him. The writer didn't even think about stopping and concluded that they didn't have to follow the script from the book. Claude was amazed at how quickly she became drunk after drinking just one glass of wine and asked if she had gone crazy. The wine brought out the playfulness in Ciaran, and she began answering questions with questions, curling her hair more and more on her finger. The sudden change in her mood at first frightened the ruler, but the playfulness that came and the sexy girl hanging over him made him blush. She gently extended her hand to his heated shoulder, the warmth of which penetrated even through his shirt. Ciaran's drunken eyes spoke for her she could not control herself and was ready to attack Claude, realizing the hopelessness of the situation. The king decided to try to calm her down by asking what she wanted to achieve with this. But she was interested in something completely different. Why was he doing this to her? Since he didn't like her at all, why did he make such a terrible mistake? Claude was very upset. Claude was very upset. He gave her a terrible oath on the stone, not wanting to answer the questions. The bishop grabbed the rider by the waist and pulled her towards him. Yeah! The girl continued to ask questions, in a calmer and quieter tone, about why he was doing this to her if he was not angry or annoyed. Recoiling from his ear, she defiantly declared that he could not know everything because he had only been in this world for seven years, and with that, everything was decided for her. Claude reached out his hand to her face, but she fixed her gaze on his lips, thinking about how she wanted to bite into them. His hand covered Siren's eyes, and unlike his heated shoulder, his palm was terribly cold. The Lord reached for his hand, and as if reading the girl's thoughts, he passionately pressed his lips to hers. This is what they both wanted, and they continued the kiss for quite a long time, until Claude decided to interrupt their connection. He reluctantly pulled away from her knowing that they were pressed for time and his meeting with Corin would soon take place. Not expecting this from the king, who, in the queen's opinion, was far from love affairs, Sirin asked with interest why he kissed her. The lord responded by noticing that she still kept her hand on his back, as if reluctant to move away from him. The girl liked to be so close to Claude, to feel the warmth of his body with her body, which she told him about. The king's face showed deep bewilderment. All this was new to him. She gently touched his face telling him that he had a beautiful back and a magnificent, seductive voice. At the end of her monologue about the Lord's beauty, Siren ended by calling him a charmer. Their time was up the clock struck five o'clock, and the ruler called his servant, of Corin. A knight emerged from the black fog and uttered a long honed greeting. The knight looked at the king, on whose shoulder his companion lay peacefully, to which Claude asked to pretend that Corin did not see this and called someone for help. The shadow commander disappeared as quickly as he appeared in his black fog. The king tried to revive Sirin, seeing that she was ready to fall asleep right in his bedroom. She herself confirmed his guesses, saying that she wanted to take a nap in this very room. All the lord could do was put his hand on her head on his shoulder so that she could take a peaceful nap while the commander looked for help. She enjoyed being in his arms and how he peacefully stroked her hair. The relaxed girl asked the king what she would receive at the end of today's schedule. The lord froze for a moment at the unexpected question. He asked if she had any ideas on this matter. Siren moved her head a little so that she could see his face and asked him to write her a letter of recommendation for admission to the academy. Puzzled, Claude advised her not to make hasty decisions about admission. She reminded him that it was his fault that what was happening between them now and the academy was a small price to pay for all her efforts. He continued to play with her and asked what he would get for putting his signature on the letter of recommendation. The girl offered him her daily kisses, to which Claude decided that they were completely crazy. A feather quickly materialized in his hand. He raised his hand to his face, making a thoughtful appearance. He placed his hand on the part of the girl's back that was not covered by the dress, wondering where he was going. He was surprised to find that the dress did not cover the girl's back. Wondering where he was going, Claude said he should leave his signature. Deciding that the open area would be suitable for this, he gently began to move the pen along her back writing out his initials. The girl made a loud noise as if it was causing her a burning pain in her back. The king was very afraid for her and politely asked if she was in pain, but he did not stop what he was doing. When Siren replied that the pain was bearable, a dark knight suddenly appeared from the fog. He brought with him a friend of the author, whose name was Dylan Aldebrand, and he greeted his majesty courteously. Raising his head after the greeting, the friend saw something he never expected to see. Siren lay unconscious in the arms of the demon lord 
leaning her head on his shoulder. Dylan was not only a friend of Miss Follick's, but also the editor-in-chief of the Demon Publishing House, which published her books. The Lord raised one eyebrow, looking Mr. Aldebrand up and down. Claude found out if Dylan knew what to do with the immobilized girl, to which her friend replied that this was not the first time, and he tearfully begged her never to drink too much again. Siren was in a fog, not noticing anything around. The king assumed that it was like a curse, trying to calm the king, Mr. Aldebrand said that the rider would not even remember anything when she woke up in the morning. He asked the lord to cast a sleeping spell on Siren in order to carry her to the bedroom calmly. The demon lord only smiled mysteriously and fulfilled his friend's request, saying that this time she would remember everything. The rays of the sun fell on Miss Follix's bed, causing her to wake up, yawn loudly, and look around quickly. She would not even remember anything. She was in her mansion, getting out of bed, and she accidentally stepped on Dylan, who was lying on the floor. Picking up her friend from the floor, she began to shake him intensively, at the same time finding out what had happened to him. The guy woke up feeling a severe headache caused by a sudden awakening. Trying to cope with the unbearable pain, Dylan began to read Siren's moral that she should not drink alcohol. He continued to say that this had happened many times before, and she didn't remember each of them. Yesterday, her friend was visited by a shadow commander who asked him for help with her. Everyone was surprised that the writer had passed out. The girl didn't particularly like talking about her little mistake, especially since drinking wine was written into the script. But her friend continued the story in every detail of how she lay unconscious on top of the half-naked demon lord. She hoped that he had made it all up so that she would never drink alcohol again. But Dylan explained to her that Corin had also told him everything, from the accusations he had made to Siren, a slander to the daily schedule. Remembering what she did last night, she wanted to go out the window, but even such a statement did not stop his story. He continued by saying that Saren had clearly kissed the ruler, but he and Charon did not know what would happen next. The confused girl reasoned that, most likely, the king would put her in prison for such an act. Dylan interrupted her anxiety by saying that the lord looked at her with a look that did not say that he did not like it. A friend handed her a bottle of a drink that would help her get rid of a painful hangover in the morning. All this time, Siren did not notice how thirsty she was all the time, so she drank the entire jar in one gulp. After hearing everything, the girl's memories gradually began to return. Her heart began to beat wildly again, and her hair stood on end from the sharply emerging images of intimacy. Someone knocked, which eased the girl's torment. She turned towards the door and invited her to enter. Standing in the passage was Abel Celia. He was a former baron whom the demon lord himself spared during the war. Now, he served as the commander of the water faction. The rider bowed her head as the young commander of the night entered, introduced herself, and greeted him. Mr. Celia spoke with a pleasant smile and the king warned him that Siren might do something extravagant. He asked her not to do anything since she had received a recommendation from the academy and she shouldn't act weirdly. Siren did not even suspect that the lord would fulfill his promise and write a letter to the academy for her. The sharp memory of him leaving his signature on her back involuntarily made her blush. The girl imagined that she must have lost the note on the way to the mansion, blushing at the thought that the signature was on her back. Sir Abel politely believed her words and confirmed that he was also very sorry that the paper was lost. The Blue Knight commander hurriedly left Siren's bedroom, loudly closing the door behind him. Towards evening, the author gathered her strength, dressed up, and went to apologize to the demon lord. He looked at her exhausted and asked if there was anything that required her apology. She was very happy that the king did not hold a grudge against her and did not even think about punishing her. Her joy ended quickly enough because he said that he would answer her in kind. Having finished the mockery, he sternly asked about the subject's application to the royal academy. Siren reminded him with a cheerful expression that the signature was left on her back, which was not exactly the right place. Handing the piece of paper to the bishop, the girl asked why he didn't sign on the piece of paper right away but preferred her back. He explained that signing the paper was quite burdensome for him but asked him to sign from below or from above. She decided that it was better to sign from below. Only a couple of seconds had passed from the moment Siren stood with her feet on the floor, but now she was in the hands of the Lord. Claude wanted to touch the place where his signature was still with his hand and use magic to send the letter to the academy quickly. Finding herself in his arms, the girl wondered what that choice from above or below meant. She felt his hand on her thigh which quickly rose higher and higher. Trying to escape from his strong hands, the writer asked the king not to rush things. Claude heard her, stopped, and removed his hand from his hip but asked what happened. Siren admitted that if she had known what the lord asked her about, she would not have chosen the option below. Dissatisfied with being so rudely interrupted, he muttered indignantly that this, too, was burdensome for him. The bishop added that no matter what the writer thinks about, she still won't achieve it. The girl sincerely did not understand what he was talking about and told him about it. 
to which he began to act. His warm hand touched the author's oh right shoulder. Oh my god! Wow! Gently touching the strap of her dress, feeling his touch, her face turned very red, and her heart began to beat wildly again, because his fingers lowered the strap of her dress, exposing her shoulder. Sirin began to explain that there was no need to remove the strap of her dress because to get to the right place, it was enough to unfasten a couple of buttons. The bishop replied that he had not looked at the dress in such detail to understand this. Taking the girl tighter, he lifted her even higher, ending up with her thrown over his shoulder. The writer humbly asked the bishop to hurry up at any moment, anyone could see them together. Claude gradually and steadily began to undo the buttons in the middle of the back. His movements were a little rough, but Siren asked him to be gentler, to which the Lord offered to let her go. The girl shook her head negatively, her face strongly betrayed her feelings, but she did not want to show them to the king. Having unbuttoned all the buttons of her dress, he began to touch her delicate skin, looking for the place where he left his signature yesterday. Vladeka touched more and more, deciding that he would not be able to untie the buttons of her dress, deciding that he had finally found the right place. The author remembered the location it was a little lower, which she embarrassedly reported. The king breathed languidly while his fingers gently touched her back. He deliberately took time to feel the warmth of her back longer. Having found the signature, he used magic to send it straight to the academy. Siren exhaled loudly and admitted that it was quite painful the Lord offered to let her go. Shaking her head affirmatively, she immediately found herself on the floor painfully hitting her tailbone. Crying from severe pain, the girl rose to her feet and looked menacingly at the back of Claude's head. All this time, Valeria stood behind the hall doors and watched everything that was happening. The bishop quickly ran to the door and opened it with a roar, scaring his wife. The only question that bothered him was how long she had been watching everything that was happening. Willia, as Claude affectionately called her, smiled playfully and pretended that she had not seen much more than she should have. Her bluff was revealed by her face, on which a cheerful grin shone, noticing which the ruler began to justify himself. Sirin hurriedly fastened the buttons of her dress on the back and hurried to join the conversation. The queen thought that there was no need for the girl to be so embarrassed, but out loud, she suggested to the king that he open a portal to return the author to his mansion. A bright glow appeared under Miss Follix's feet, and she quickly began to sink into the floor. The couple watched as the writer disappeared from their field of vision, swinging her arms cheerfully. Giggling contentedly, the queen handed the report for which she had come. The king, confused, picked up the paper and asked what was making Valeria laugh so much. She tried to change the subject by asking whether his majesty liked the girl, but he immediately saw through her plan and asked, not to change the topic of conversation. Still having fun, Willia noticed that the king was in love with Sirin, and it was no longer just a game for him. The lord looked at her with a stern look and dryly replied that he was not interested in such things as love. When a demon fell in love, the object of his affection began to smell to him the aroma of fresh fruit, which is exactly what the queen told him. He became lost in thought, trying to figure out what smell he smelled when he was quite close to Siren. Their first kiss surfaced in his head. It was then that he felt a sweetish smell, similar to succubus peaches. His wife stated that she seemed to smell a pleasant aroma coming from the girl. Claude quickly realized that Willia was planning to return to Atara, but he reminded her of the promise she had made to him. Valeria remembered well that fateful day for her when she almost lost her brother. During the war, Claude Stern unexpectedly appeared, freeing demon enslaved people from the tyrant lords of the Empire of Light, trying to save her brother, Beelzebub Etar. From the fate that awaited him, the queen swore on a stone to fulfill any desire of the ruler. The slave liberator wanted one thing to become the only emperor of the demon world. At that very moment she vowed to do everything in her power to help him fulfill his wish. By her action she was able to save her brother from death, but he was still sent to prison. Claude told her that if she returned to Atara now he would become the sole ruler. She desired to return to her home, to the castle which became more and more deserted every year. She knew that the royal palace would not be empty without her. There were still enough people in it to take care of the king. With a new rising wave of playfulness, she decided that she would pray for the king before going to bed so that he would have enough strength for the night's work. As she left, she told him that people would become worried if the reigning monarch did not have a consort and heirs. Leaving the demon lord alone with this information, she slammed the door and hurried to her chambers. There, she was met by a maid who informed her that the bath was ready, and that she would immediately bring a waterproof copy of the queen's favorite novel. Valeria plunged into the bathroom and opened a book, but first decided to check the page of her favorite author on social networks. 
The queen was worried about the writer's lack of new posts. She thought that the girl did not like it in the castle, and that this could interfere with the implementation of her plan upon her return to the palace. She was worried that the queen would return to Atara. Then she decided to ask the maid to help her since she did not want it to end with Sirin escaping from the palace. The maid Rosalia listened to the queen's order and decided that it was better to go to serve in the royal author's mansion than to lose her head for refusing. What pleased her most was the opportunity to return with Valeria to Atara if she fulfilled her instructions. Pleased with her cunning, the ruler's wife smiled and allowed the maid to leave her. On the other side of the palace, Miss Follocks went out onto the balcony of her mansion to see who was making the strange sounds from the street. Among the treetops, she saw three silhouettes, namely Sir Rayfield, Commander Abel Silius, and a girl standing between them. Siren looked at them in surprise until they disappeared from view through the doorway of her mansion. After waiting only a few minutes, the girl met them in the main wide hall. Sir Rayfield was the best friend of her editor, Dylan, and also led the Golden Knights. A previously unknown girl came to the attention of the mistress of the house, and she began to examine her in surprise. Ray decided to introduce the guest kindly, saying that the girl's name was Rosalia and she was sent to Sirin by the generous queen. The maid was very happy to begin serving her new mistress. The writer had not seen such enthusiasm for quite a long time. The girl had never had her servant. It came as a shock to her that she could command someone. She thought that this was an overly broad gesture on Valeria's part, but Rosalia was ready to start from that very moment. Deciding that there was nothing to do, Miss Follox asked the maid to show her around the castle the next day. Having said this, she saw how everyone present changed their faces. Sir Field decided to clarify whether she really didn't know what day it was tomorrow. She really was not aware that the entrance ceremony to the Royal Academy was supposed to take place the next day. Ray told her that the committee rejected more than half of the applications based on exam results alone. Abel assured her that with a letter of recommendation from the Demon Lord himself, she would enroll despite her low scores. Before the arrival of the King, the Academy was in a very deplorable state but thanks to the reforms carried out, it blossomed before our eyes. Sir Rayfield and Commander Abel Celia were graduates of the academy when it consisted of only one building. The captain of the Golden Knights was also one of the professors at the academy and, as such, would be forced to give Sirin a failing grade if she arrived at the wrong time. The writer was pleasantly surprised to learn that Sir Field and Sir Celia were professors. The young people left the mansion, leaving the girl alone with this information. While they were discussing the functionality of the academy, Rosalia successfully collected a stack of books to prepare for the entrance exams. The owner of the mansion turned around after hearing a loud noise and was horrified by the number of books brought. With all zeal, she began to prepare for exams in mathematics, science, and languages, as well as alchemy, the theory of magic, and demonology. She diligently crammed the rest of the day and all night after passing the exams, her strength began to leave her. Exhausted, Sirin began to fall out of her chair but felt someone's hand holding her behind her back. It was Sir Abel. He was quite nice to her and came over to show her around the campus since he had some free time. The two of them walked between campuses and the blue commander of the night gave the writer a full tour. From their left, they heard the sound of a person approaching and the voice of the demon lord told them that all the first years had long gathered and were only waiting for them. Abel bowed courteously and greeted his majesty placing his right hand over his heart. The king was looking for Sirin Follix. He urgently needed to tell her something. It turned out that the demon lord wanted to discuss the details of their upcoming scene with her. She quickly interrupted the king so that he would not discuss such secret information in front of strangers. Sir Samia quickly realized that it was about him and hurried to say goodbye so as not to interfere with their conversation. The girl waved after the departing knight for a long time, and as soon as he moved away at a sufficient distance, she sank in anticipation, Siren said, in anticipation of the upcoming conversation. Noticing the upset face of the writer, Claude wondered if she might have eaten something wrong or not eaten at all. Sighing with relief, Siren admitted that she only ate the sandwich that Sir Abel gave her. Despite the fact that she practically did not eat, Miss Follix felt as beautiful and fresh as ever. The news of the girl's condition pleased the king. He did not want her to pass out again while recreating part of the book. Using all her charm, she tried to persuade his majesty to cancel everything today because of her extreme fatigue. Ciaran was completely exhausted. Even her attempt to show herself from her most beautiful side was unsuccessful. King Claude turns around and begins to walk away from her. She is watching King Claude going towards the castle. King does not pay any attention to the girl she is unhappy after King Claude's behavior, and this part ends here. Thank you for watching till the end it took a lot of time and energy to make these kinds of videos, so please subscribe to my channel to watch more interesting Mandwa stories.